Hey, this is Jeffrey, and welcome to another edition of Stock Smart, the February 4th, 2021 edition. And I really appreciate all the downloads. We, um, we're hitting over a thousand downloads now, and it's the podcast has only been up for a week. I'm really impressed. I didn't expect the, uh, the amount of traffic so far, but it's great. And so thank you very much. So let's talk about uh, IPOs first. Should I get involved? Should like the average investor or the retail investor get involved? And there are a lot of retail investors now because of sites like Robinhood where it's free to trade. There's a couple reasons why historically most people have said don't get involved in IPOs. Here's a few reasons. Average investors, meaning you're buying it on the exchange, will not get the initial price. What happens is, is when a company has an IPO, they essentially will give their preferred customers, like if um, JP Morgan takes a company public, they will give their preferred customers the initial public offering price. You'll get the adjusted exchange rate price if you buy it as a retail customer. Someone on Robinhood or a non-preferred customer is going to get it at a exchange price. So you're not gonna get the preferred price. You'll get the bumped up after price. And what can happen a lot of times is that someone who gets the preferred price will get a big bump in the stock and then they'll dump the stock. So that does happen. So that's one reason maybe you wouldn't want to be involved in an IPO. The other is emotion. People get excited about these stocks. When Uber, Uber went public, people who know what Uber is and everyone knows what Uber is wanted to get behind the company because they're like, I use Uber, I think it's a great product. And it has a tendency to, to inflate the price of the stock because people know it. So that, that, is, that does happen a great deal. IPOs, when they start, you have to remember this, they don't have real world valuations. You, you, they, they haven't developed a channel yet of an acceptable price. So they don't really have support. There's no resistance. Stocks generally, when you look at stocks over time, they move, and we're gonna talk about uh, volatility later, but they move within a range, within their mean. So when a, a stock is tested over time, it will have a range or a, a mean that it usually moves within. But an IPO doesn't, hasn't established anything like that. So it, it can be very volatile and can have great movements in price and price fluctuations. Another reason why you might not want to get involved in a stock that's an IPO is because there's a lockup period generally for insiders who hold a stock that goes public. So they may have up to the lockup period could be six months where after six months of a stock going public, the insiders can start to sell their shares. And depending on how many shares are issued to insiders, that could have a dramatic effect on the stock. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a popular short strategy is to look up the lockup date on an IPO and then to be betting against the stock heading into when the lockup period expires based on how many insiders have stock in the company. You know, with a stock like Zoom last year, a lot of the people, hopefully, you know, the insiders who had that stock didn't sell it and they did really well holding on to it. But it's not always true in every case. So conventional wisdom says the average investor or the retail investor should not get involved in IPOs. But let's take a look at what's happened over to all the IPOs from 2020. So first one that comes to mind is Airbnb. Everyone knows the service, Airbnb, where you can go and stay at someone else's home and rent at a discounted rate. I like Airbnb because I love to travel and when I take my kids with me, I love the idea of being able to make a breakfast rather than spending like $100 on a hotel breakfast when sometimes all you want is a cereal and coffee. I love Airbnb for things like that. It's just so much more efficient economically to be in Airbnb. It's more comfortable. You can bring your own food. You can bring your own alcohol if you're gonna have drinks. And I love Airbnb. It opened at 144 uh, when it was an IPO. That was the public offering price. I mean, not that wasn't the initial price, but that was the price that people could get in on. The high was 216, and the low was 121. It's now sitting at 187. So, if you were invested in Airbnb, you'd have to say it's a winner right now. Um, DoorDash, another one that comes to mind. We most of us, especially during COVID, have used DoorDash. DoorDash opened at a very high price, opened at $189. The high was $256, the low was $135. It's sitting at $182 right now. So within, you know, it, is, it hasn't been even a year, it's down a little. Palantir, the tech company that works uh, heavily with the government, opened at $9.66. The high was $45, the low was $8.98. Now it sits about $32 to $33. Has developed a lot of support, and you'd have to call it a winner, 
nearly up 400%. Snowflake tech company opened at 238, was a high of 429, Low was 208, and now it's 306. So it's a winner as well. And Rocket Companies, um, which is a stock I do like, opened at 2160, high was 34, and the low was 1750. It now sits around 21, 22 dollars. So it's a small winner. So I think conventional wisdom, and a lot of times when you have these, the relics or the old masters who come on these shows, CNBC. I don't think they account, I think they account for the old days where there wasn't as much retail investing. I think because the retail investor is doing so much trading on its own. So the people who are trading for themselves at either E-Trade or Robinhood or any of the other companies that allow you to trade now. I think those are helping these IPOs because those are the people who get behind them because they're the users. Traditional um, institutional investors are a little more fearful because of the history of IPOs, which generally has not been good. Because according to Verdad Capital, the median IPO out of like 4,000 IPOs. Now remember this timeline. This is reviewed since the late 80s. Most of those IPOs lost 31% of their value after three years. After five years, the loss was greater at 41%. But I don't think, I think that's flawed data because I think this has to be looked at in a new paradigm. When you have these investors who are investing for themselves, propping up these stocks because they like them. These, this is a new paradigm of investor. And so I think a smaller time frame to review data is very essential when you look at these IPOs. So to me, we just went over you know five of the IPOs of, from 2020. There are more, but we went over five of them, and there's only one that didn't hasn't been a good investment for for the investor. So I think conventional wisdom has changed, or it should. And I think IPOs, if you're you know if you know the company and you and you know the research and you believe in it. That can be a good thing. One IPO that's coming up that's interesting to people, because uh, a lot of people know it if you're dating, if you're single, is Bumble. Bumble is going to have its initial public offering on February 11th. So those who like that stock or like that company may want to be, may be interested in that. Um, and let me tell you, people who invested and stayed in stocks, if you would have had, if you would have invested 10,000 into Amazon when it had its IPO, which was in 1997, price was $18 per share, now that get this, you would you would have 19 million today, not bad. 10,000 in Netflix in May 2002 at $15 a share would be worth about four and a half million. 10,000 in Apple, and now Apple split a million times, right? Or it's a bunch of times, I should say, at its IPO price of 22 in December 1980, and you'd have approximately 11 million. But Buffett, I saw him last year when there were a bunch of IPOs coming out, and Buffett said. It's not for the average investor. I'm not sure that with what's going on in the current market that that's true anymore. So I would say know the company, know what you're getting involved in, and stick with it through the the, the rough patches, which they will have because an IPO is going to have to build its its level of support. And then I would be a little wary when if you know if you're paying attention to the lock update because the lock update could be a time when you may want to buy if you really love the stock and you want to hold it, you might want to buy a put for some protection. So that's what I think. I think that's what you should. Uh, that's the suggestion on IPOs for me. I think. I think if you know the company, you should get involved. So let's look at a stock now. Stock it's watch. A very common stock to everyone. Most people have uh, five or six or seven or eight of these. This company's products in their home, and it's Apple. And why are we going to talk about Apple? Well, because Apple is making big news right now. Apple is nearing a deal with Hyundai to build a self-driving electric vehicle, which will be autonomous. It's very interesting. This technology is coming, and I'll tell you the seriousness of this can be can be stated in one one specific example. When Apple announced this a couple months ago, Elon Musk made a comment, and so he knows that they're coming in, and if they come in, they're going to be a serious competitor. And you could just see it. You can see all the integration possibilities with all the Apple products you already own. And if you could make an autonomous car, now I think from what I understand a bit, and I've been in autonomous cars before. I was in a car that was laid out with the technology made by Aptiv, which is also a very interesting stock, APTV. That stock has doubled really in the past year. I've been in one of their cars when I was in Vegas, and Aptiv, their technology is interesting, but they need to have a driver behind the wheel when it drives because it's not going to know things like when someone jumps out of the road and or when there's construction going on that wasn't wasn't planned for they have the grid mapped out really well but they cannot understand key key things that are changing and this has to do what's really interesting is what the technology is is because it's all cameras right it's a bunch of cameras on the vehicle 
and sensors. The problem really is, is that the computer doesn't have the ability to take the camera picture and compress it enough in, the, in a quick enough time to get the answer it needs, which is instantaneous. And, and we all know if a dog's ever pulled out and uh, run out in front of your car, you know how instantaneous that can be. So my thinking with this autonomous vehicles is it's gonna be like the express lanes. When I was in Chicago or even in California, there's the, on the Kennedy Expressway, we used to take the express lane every day. And that would be, you know, it'd go in one direction. So I think what we're looking at for autonomous cars would be what we call a closed loop, meaning everyone in that space or lane would be in an autonomous car. Now you can imagine what's kind of funny as I think about autonomous vehicles, I'm thinking about the ductability of your vehicle as you have business meetings in your car while it drives itself to your place of business or work or home. And I think that's very, very interesting going forward. Uh, makes the car even more deductible, if you will. So let's go to our section called the average investor or what the average is investor. Like a retail investor or just Joe investor on the street. Um, I got a question from Jane and keep the questions coming to Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y at Jeffrey Camus, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y Camus, K-A-M-Y-S dot com. About 25, 30 questions a day now. Um, I appreciate all the, the feedback and the input. And Jane asked me, what is the VIX? So the VIX... It's called uh, the fear indicator by people who are in the business, it, but it's an, in, it's an indicator or a index of volatility in the market. The way that the index is determined is based on the options activity in things like calls and puts. And so when there's an increase in calls and puts in the market, volatility index, the VIX, increases. The VIX generally in the past has sat at 10, 11, 12. But if you look in the last year, the VIX now sits in a comfort zone at 20. And what that is, is very interesting. If you're following the market closely, there has been a huge spike in options purchasing. And so what that indicates to me is that the new normal for the VIX is probably 20, meaning the resting period. It used to be 11, 12, but now when you look at it over a period of time, the new normal for the VIX is 20. Right now it's at 22, it spikes and goes up and down based on implied volatility. So when there's more, when there's more uh, price differences and the pricing and the options changes, that's how the VIX adjusts. And so that could either be positive or negative. Generally it's looked at as negative. Obviously they call it the fear index. It's the, the formula for calculating it is extremely complicated. But it, what it does tell us is it tells us that there's expected volatility. I think when you look at the VIX now, you should look at it if it's at 20, the market is normal because we have so much more, we have such an increase in options activity, the VIX baseline now is a different number where it used to be 12. So the VIX, the VIX baseline now at 20, so when you look at it, if it's over 30, you would think maybe the market is unsettled and that could go either way. It could go up, it could go down. Low volatility now, it used to be like 12. Now you'd say low volatility would be like 20 because that's where it's at. We're at 22 now in the VIX. And really what the VIX does, and I want to just make it clear, it tracks the options that are related to the S&P 500. That's what the VIX is. It's very complicated, but it's interesting to watch. And it really became in vogue to watch it when the VIX spiked up a, a year back or two years back and it went ballistic because everyone was shorting it. And we could talk about shorting it in another podcast. It's very complicated and interesting to do, interesting to talk about, but very complicated nonetheless. But hey, thanks again for listening. Appreciate all the feedback. It's another edition of Stock Smart with Jeffrey Camus. Have a great day.